Welcome to In Transition, a program dedicated to the practice of content marketing in government. Here's your host, David Pembroke. Hello and welcome to the first episode of In Transition, a podcast dedicated to the practice of content marketing in government. My name's David Pembroke. Thanks for joining me. As this is our first program, we do have a very special guest lined up for you. But first, I thought it might be useful to explain why we're making this program, and what we will achieve in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Communication is a fundamental priority for all governments. On a daily basis, all over the world, at a municipal, state, federal, and international level, governments interact with hundreds of millions of citizens and stakeholders with the objective of building stronger, more sustainable communities and improving the well-being of citizens. If government gets communication right, they can take big strides to achieving this simple and compelling goal. Content marketing is a strategic and measurable business process that relies on the curation, creation and distribution of valuable, relevant and consistent content to engage and inform a clearly defined audience with the objective of driving a desired citizen or stakeholder action. Now, this definition is an adaptation of the Content Marketing Institute's formal definition of content marketing, and I have amended it so as it relates to the government sector. The content marketing process includes research, strategy, the setting of objectives, the understanding of audiences, selection of media types and channels, publishing, monitoring, measurement and evaluation. It's precisely the process that people working in government communication need to take in order to be more effective in their engagement with citizens and stakeholders. And if I might, just as a small piece of advice to all of you out there, encourage you to visit the Content Marketing Institute's website and become part of the community and access the vast resources that they've assembled on their website. The purpose of this podcast is to improve the quality and effectiveness of government communication around the world. We'll explore the changes in communication brought about by technology and discuss how government can use content marketing to more effectively engage citizens and stakeholders. We'll speak to the world's leading experts in government communication and encourage them to share their stories, their experience, their triumphs and their setbacks so we all learn and we all become more effective in telling the story of governments. Now, I promised you a big name for our first program, and here he is. Alex Aitken is the Executive Director of Communication in the UK Government, and he joins me from London. Alex, hello, and thanks for being in Transition. Morning, uh, David. Delighted to be on your program. Alex, before we dive into the subject matter, I wonder if you might introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I think I may be a bit familiar to some of your audience because colleagues of mine from the UK have gone to work in Australian government communications over the years and I've met lots of Australian communicators who have come to the UK. So it's a pleasure to be talking to um, uh, old colleagues and, and new friends, I hope. Fundamentally, I do three things, strategy, management and head of profession. As the director for UK government communications, I set the government's communication strategy, uh, which is born out of the coalition's uh, agreement. And that is um, uh, set out in the government communications uh, plan. We have three big priorities, building a strong economy, a fairer society and extending British influence in, in the world. And they are set out in the government communications plan. And that's a strategy. Second, management. I manage the cabinet office and uh, number 10 uh, communications uh, team. Third, head of profession. As the leading professional in government communications, my role is to make the best practice of our work the standard. And I take that professional role extremely seriously because communicators are professionals and therefore raising professional standards is something that I think about every day. Alex, there's no question that the UK government has been an exemplar in how you have modernised the approach to government communication over the last few years. Can you describe the changes that you've made and the principles that have underpinned those changes? Yeah. I'll start with the £1 billion sterling question, and that was the um, uh, challenge my predecessors faced in 2010 when they were 
asked by the incoming government, by the coalition government, OK, we spend £1 billion on government communications. That's a lot of money. What do we get for a billion pounds? And my predecessors found that a very difficult question to answer. And so the government ministers said reasonably, all right, well, we don't know what a billion pound does. Let's try doing it for half that, for 500 million, and we will see what we get for that. And therefore, the failure of government communicators to adequately demonstrate the value of their work, to evaluate the impact they had on the public and community, as you mentioned, meant that it cost good communicators their roles. It meant we couldn't um, continue with some of the communication programs we did. So my drive essentially has been to prove the value of communications through improvement programs that are designed to drive up professionalism to deliver cross-government communications, to improve internal communications, an often understated but hugely important part of government comms, and that programme is ongoing. So how did the communicating community respond to that rather massive challenge, the, the sort of burning platform that they were standing upon? I think with any major campaign, you get about 10% of the audience who are determined to help you because they can see it's absolutely right. You get 10% of the audience who are going to oppose you because some people oppose most things. And then you've got to win the hearts and minds of the group in the middle. And doing that was by saying, this, we are a profession. This is the communications profession. This is not some sort of add-on to government business. This is core. Government essentially does um, uh, four things. We can tax, we can uh, reg regulate, we can legislate, and we can communicate. So this is one of the four essential tools for government. And getting it right is something that will improve, enrich, and in some cases, save the lives of the citizens that we serve. But that certainly drove the change, was it? This ability that things had to change. It wasn't a, 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 an optional thing. Change was coming. Well, the change was coming. And, of course, the other thing we found is that communications is uh, changing. My challenge to the many good press officers we still have in government is to say we're not going to need press officers uh, in the future and those old skills about writing and crafting and drafting they'll still have a role communication channels and tools don't go away but what I need from the future communicator is the ability to analyze data to create great shareable content to build movements of allies that, that create advocates for our uh, public policies and I need people who will speak truth to power, to be the conscience of, of the organisation. And that all-round communicator is a long way from the traditional view of the government press officer crafting and drafting and sending out press releases. And how difficult has it been to transition from the old to the new and to update the skills of the traditional press officer, as you describe them, to the modern content creator and distributor? You've got to be a bit Marxist about um, uh, this. You've got to set out that there is a clear goal and that destination is worth it for those who go on the journey and then you've got to mandate um, the change. We ran the first um, government communication service, that's the GCS uh, change program, through November uh, 13 and finished uh, last month in October 14. That was 12 programs of activity, proper project management to deliver the changes we need. At the heart of that was our professional development program, the Aspire course. We've put on 2,400 courses in the core disciplines, areas where we need people to improve campaign delivery, evaluation, uh, digital uh, communications, all related to your theme of content uh, marketing. And we put people through those um, uh, tr training uh, courses. But we have also required, as part of their professional membership of the GCS, that they undertake, alongside that, four pieces of training, of professional development, of which two have got to be focused on evaluation and digital, because those are the skills where we were most um, uh, uh, lacking. Now, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this would probably think this is incredible, that you can actually get across departmentals, you can get across agency and get everyone to buy into a singular program where they can surrender their self-interest, um, their ministers and the staff of those uh, ministers surrender their interests in the in interests of the, the central narrative and the capability. So can you just describe how, again, that you went about building that unity? Yeah. Yeah, look, it's it, it's easy. Uh, in a word, it's leadership. And leadership is not something that I um, uh, just uh, practice. Leadership is the responsibility of everyone who works in the government 
communication service of the UK and in Australian public service uh, communications. Leadership is about you doing your job to the best of your ability and accepting that we're better together, working collectively and not trying to do someone else's job or manage up or uh, manage sideways, but do your job brilliantly. And when you get people in the room and you lead them by saying, right, what are the interests that we have together? So, for example, um, some an area where Australia and the UK government are working um, uh, closely together to deal with an important international crisis, Ebola. Now, uh, getting uh, our uh, foreign um, uh, ministry colleagues in the room with our Department of Health colleagues, they wouldn't ne necessarily see what the uh, obvious benefit was. But but setting out a campaign plan and starting with the objectives and being very clear about what we are trying to achieve, reassurance of uh, UK domestic audiences about the threat, the lack of threat of, of Ebola coming here, but also showing how we are tackling the problem at source in Sierra Leone, primarily for the um, uh, UK, and showing how they could work together and, and showing how they were better together is absolutely critical. The methodology behind that we summarise as OASIS. Um, every campaign, every communications activity activity we undertake should have an objective, that's the O, a clear audience, um, a strategy, implementation milestones, and then scoring or evaluation. So to get people to work together saying, right, how is our approach um, uh, defined? What's our OASIS um, our answer to this problem is the basic way we get people to work together. And again, I believe that you had very strong buy-in from all the way at the top from the Prime Minister Cameron, who noticed or understood the power if you were able to, to to collectively work together? Yeah, I mean, look, everyone in governments all around the world um, uh, know that um, uh, working together, treating communications as a profession, doing evaluation, these are all sensible things. I sometimes think the issue is that communicators need to be more brave, more robust in explaining to the people they serve, chief executives, political leaders, ministers, about where we are trying to get with communications, changing lives for the better, how we get there, best professional practice. So practically, when we started the um, improvement program uh, last uh, year, the first thing we did was um, uh, what we call in the UK a right round where uh, my minister, the minister for the cabinet office, writes the prime minister and that letter is copied to all the um, cabinet ministers saying, this is what we intend to do, and this will change communications for the better. And, of course, we briefed all the departmental direct communications on what we were going to do. And of the, uh, I think, the 20 uh, letters we uh, sent out, we had four or five letters back from Secretary of State saying, well, how will this affect my press office? I don't want to lose my... my press office? How can you um, guarantee that I'll retain a degree of um, uh, independence of action and so on? And therefore, there were challenges and we dealt with those um, uh, challenges. But I would also emphasize that this is not about me or the um, PM or the Minister for the Cabinet Office saying, this is how it will be and it's my road or the high road. It is about saying we are better together and these are the professional arguments for doing it and they are pretty compelling. So if you have a better idea, then we could go that way. But we can't see um, uh, where that is. And the docs and the Secretary of State uh, came on board and that's how we proceeded with the program. Well, congratulations. It's a stunning achievement. So at this point in time, how, how far uh, developed uh, along the path uh, do you feel that you are at the moment? That sounds like a vast training program that you have implemented so far. 60% of the way along the program in terms of communications delivery and 80% of the way along professional development. And I can say that because we produce the government communications plan. It's there on the um, uh, GCS um, uh, website. And every quarter we monitor the implementation of the plan and we ask departments to assess their professionalism against the um, uh, GCS uh, criteria. And the last quarterly returns that came in um, uh, in October said that we're about 60% of the way on campaign delivery against the objectives in the 14-15 plan. And departments ex assess themselves at about 80% of um, uh, professional standards. Now, those are um, uh, uh, self-assessments. They're done by professionals. It's in their interest to do them uh, properly. I think they're roughly right. You think about that, if um, uh, government communications is spending about £500 million uh, a year in the UK, then we're spending 60% of it well. So there are issues there. But frankly, if we are meeting 60% 
of our targets at this stage of the year, and we can drive that to, in terms of delivery to 80 or 90 percent by the end of the year, I think that's money spent. Well, it seems like you're doing a great job in building out the capability and obviously getting that alignment right. How then uh, do you look upon, you know, the traditional communication practices such as, you know, public relations and advertising? Where, where do they sit in terms of your plans for the future? I heard someone uh, say at a conference I was at recently, we need to put the public back into public relations. And I think public relations got um, uh, reduced to media relations and actually got released to press in terms of newspaper uh, uh, relations. And therefore, looking at public relations as the full uh, ability to deal with all media. I mean, media is either tri-media, it's press broadcast and digital, or it's actually uni-media. It's all digital, effectively, now. And therefore, moving from a position where we craft and draft to a position where media officers can produce content and tweet and blog and uh, write briefings uh, where they uh, uh, need to. So the traditional skills remain important as the core. If you can't write, you can't communicate. But it is actually, we've moved forward. And the most compelling pieces of communication I see are pictures or videos. Pictures are a very ancient, probably the first form of communication. Videos, of course, um, uh, effectively the most uh, modern, but we are moving forward um, rapidly. We did a review of our digital communications last year, and it showed that government communications, in terms of digital output, was improving, but society's use of digital was improving faster. Therefore, we have to make more progress to keep up with the way that you and I and your um, uh, audiences are using digital communications. In terms of your relations with uh, the press and, and with the media, how, how have they responded to um, the UK government communications getting their act together? Have they responded well or have they been hostile to the changes? Well, we will always have an adversarial relationship with the main uh, political press because that is their job and we respect that. They're an essential part of the um, uh, diplomatic process. I think uh, many journalists will be um, uh, generally pleased with the service they get from um, UK government media officers. There will always be issues about deadlines and that that, that, that sort of thing. Across um, uh, from the purely political press, if you look at consumer press and broadcasts and so on, relations are generally good. They are less interested in how we are changing. What they're interested in is the stories and the information they get in a timely and effective way. And certainly in part of my role as head of profession, in making sure we keep standards up and making sure sure we stay on the right side of the divide between government, which is what I am responsible for, and politics, which is what the political uh, parties do, is is, is hugely important. My job is to promote, explain and justify the policies of the elected government. But what I don't do and what my press officers don't do is attack the opposition. That is a job for the um, uh, political um, parties, press offices. Looking to the future now, what are some of the changes that you think will dominate your world in perhaps the next two or three years? Yeah, we've um, uh, had a a project uh, looking at this and uh, considering this, and it it comes down to things that your readers will be familiar with, how we um, uh, use data, information about audiences to the best effect, how we create really compelling content that can be shared and um, used, and how we build alliances that run government campaigns jointly with people. So just looking at a couple of those quickly, in terms of building uh, alliances, in our public health work, we've had some very effective joint campaigns with big organisations, big supermarkets, with Disney um, uh, in one uh, case, that have allowed us to use their channels and their brands to get across public health messages effectively to um, uh, children and to um, uh, adults. Um, In terms of uh, the content we create, the Scotland referendum, which um, uh, you will uh, know about, was a fascinating moment where there was a proper campaign for the heart and soul of the United uh, Kingdom. And that campaign, a lot of the the debate and the information and the campaign work that we did was on Facebook and Twitter and through our You Decide uh, website and through those channels. It was the first campaign, first major campaign I've uh, been involved in where you recognize that actually the newspaper um, uh, voice wasn't so important. Most of the newspapers in Scotland were in favour of the union position and against separation, but nevertheless, they didn't seem to have the impact that digital 
channels have had. Therefore, the content we created for Facebook, some pieces of content, we got 10% engagement rates with, and it was widely shared. Some pieces of content we got 0.1% engagement uh, with, and therefore understanding what content would appeal to audiences was a huge piece of learning from that campaign. What sort of content creation capabilities do you have inside the government? We've just, um, as part of the reform program, we've changed our corporate team for the government communications uh, service and grouped it under four eyes. It's four uh, eyes, uh, impact, ideas, uh, implementation um, and insight because those are the four competencies we expect government communicators to demonstrate. So we start with insight and we have an insight team that provides the research about uh, audiences. And then we have an ideas team, and that is the content team. So we've created, and answer to your question, a team of content creators who can look at a campaign and say, what is the most effective way to get this across to the audiences we are trying to reach? And often, this is not about direct bombarding them with, with emails or tweets. This is about saying, can we put something out there? I think of our Building Britain uh, campaign, which is about the infrastructure that the UK government is creating across the uh, country. And it's saying to builders and um, project managers and manufacturers, show us, tweet us, blog post um, images and stories about how you are building the infrastructure projects that will help improve lives and help improve infrastructure in, in the UK over the next 5, 10, 15 years. And that sort of campaign gets a great response because people are proud of their projects and they want to show them off, which helps government illustrate how it has a multi-million pound infrastructure program through the people who are delivering it rather than through direct communications. It's a, it, it's a fascinating uh, program that you outline. Uh, most people aren't there. Most governments are really not operating with the degree of maturity and sophistication uh, and the effectiveness, obviously, that you are operating with. What advice would you, be, would you give to some of our listeners who are sitting in siloed operations, you know, perhaps a bit dispirited thinking, this utopian world is impossible. What what are the simple steps that people could take to start to bring about some change and bring about some momentum? Yeah, we're we're not perfect. We um, uh, have got a long way to go. I said, you know, at the moment uh, over this year, sixty percent campaign effectiveness. So we need to drive uh, that up. What your colleagues can do is you start with the first steps. You know, the way to eat an elephant is piece by piece, not trying to do the whole thing uh, together. And if you if, you're, um, uh, if Australian communicators want to look at some of the material, I think the most important single thing I, I point them to is the government digital services design uh, principles, which is about digital work, but it's applicable to communications. And it says start small. It says iterate. Do things gradually. Don't um, uh, uh, just try and do the whole thing uh, in one. And it also says start with a user need. And I think the most important thing, single thing I'd say is think about the needs of the audience, not about the needs needs of the chief executive or politician as the starting um, uh, point and thinking about the user need is, is critically important. As a practical thing, um, uh, you and your, your colleagues and Australian government communicators are welcome to join the UK Government Communication Service. You can sign up on the um, GCS website because we encourage people to sign up and get the emails and the information that we put out. It's um, uh, something that's from the UK but I think it has international um, application and, and so on. But I think starting with the user need Re uh, realizing that you represent the needs of the audience, not um, uh, uh, as as the primary uh, goal, and then building up other ways that people can move forward. It's their careers. You know, you have some very very talented people, and therefore them making the most of their careers. They can't just sit back and say it's all impossible. They've got to build and build and iterate and learn, and you learn from your mistakes. And from that springs success. But it does take courage to speak to power, doesn't it? Because sometimes that agenda doesn't support the agenda of the political masters. Yeah. So um, when I was um, fairly new uh, in uh, this job, I went into a board meeting and I uh, there were 11 uh, people in the room and me and I gave the communications uh, report and I quickly realised there were 12 communication experts at least there were 12 people who thought they knew about <laughs> communication and that was a bit of a wake-up call coming to government um, and so the next time the following month I went back I armed myself with data 
it was a board meeting about internal communications and civil service communications. And we just did a survey monkey poll in between the two meetings to illustrate why the communications approach we were proposing was the right one. And the insight that I, as a communicator, provided from that meant that the rest of the board said, all right, we get it now. And what was interesting was the insight was around why won't civil servants be more favorable towards civil service reform and improvement? And is it because they just don't want to change? And the polling that we did proved that civil servants were broadly in favor of reform. But because their IT was so crap, they couldn't do the things in terms of being faster and flexible and more customer responsive that they wanted to do. And providing that information to the board, it's the IT you need to fix, not the communications, was a big win for the credibility of government communications. But you still need that centralised buy-in by the sounds of things. To succeed with a program like yours, you really do need that that agreed centralised, let's do this together, we are one government, we, are, we have one story to tell and let's tell it well. I think I think if you look at um, uh, I think I think you need a story to start with. I think you need to have a clear story that has a mission, what we are trying to achieve, and a destination, what this will look like when it's done. And you've got to be able to set that out um, uh, in uh, less than a hundred words. I mean, communicators um, uh, are occasionally guilty of writing overlong, verbose. Um, uh, campaign plans with uh, endless uh, top lines and, and lines to take and our ability to be succinct and to the point and set out the destination and the goal is something that I think will convince um, uh, the C-suite, the um, uh, leadership of the uh, validity of our plans in most uh, cases. Well, Alex, congratulations for everything that you have achieved there with the UK government, certainly leading the way in the change and reform of government communication and the way that you are able to use the techniques and practice of content marketing to bring about the changes to the effectiveness of your communication with both citizens and stakeholders. Thanks very much for joining us. And there is a bit of history in podcasting around the world that the first guest comes back on the 100th. And I look forward to inviting you back then where we can discuss a little bit more about the practice of content marketing in government. Thanks again for your time today. Thank you very much, David. You've been listening to In Transition, the program dedicated to the practice of content marketing in government. For more, visit us at intransitionpodcast.com.au.